today is to speak to this notion of evidence-based approaches to enhancing educational quality. Being one, where did this notion of evidence-based education begin? I'm going to present to you a beginning definition. Evidence-based education, and this is drawn from um, Sackett and others who are actually in medicine, because that's where the origins of EBE, evidence-based education, uh, are. It refers to a principle. The principle is that we seek, synthesize, and use the best evidence available on what works to provide educational services of highest quality to students. So it's a principle. Now, how do we do it? How do we implement it? Well, in theory, there are three steps. We have to adopt and apply a practice or a program, whether it's on online, uh, whether it's a, a simple teaching practice like reflective teaching, um, by doing three things. One, we have to draw on the best scientific evidence, research evidence that is available out there on that particular practice. Use our own practice-based knowledge and expertise. And then make a decision as to whether or not to adopt and implement it, taking into consideration student needs, interests, and the circumstances. And if you're serving minors early childhood, you would also take care, uh, uh, think about caregivers, right? Because they are very much a part of our stakeholders. So there are three things. It it's, comes from a generalizable body of evidence, research out there, but brings it to the local practice situation, right? And it involves the practitioner, the educator who is actually directly in touch with the students. This is, in theory, what the notion of evidence-based education is. So let's think of an example. I will give an example of multiplication tables. How did you learn multiplication tables when you were a child? I can tell you how I learned it. They made us stand up in rows, and we had to say, one times two is one. Right? One times two is two, two times two is four. We had to kind of, it's recitation. How many of us did it that way? A bar? <laughs> Pretty much everybody. The recitation method is very popular. What's the research evidence on it? Right? Uh, so we would ask that question based on the most rigorous studies available. What is the research evidence that the recitation method works? What's the best decision to make if, based on my own? practice-based expertise, or the practice-based expertise of my other colleagues who are also experts in working with that population. And then, uh, what are the local needs and circumstances? So there are three things, right? So the logic is very simple. Evidence-based education will, be, is, will improve quality. That's the assumption. And because it improves quality, we're going to get better achievement levels. The outcomes will be better in the short run and the long term. Simple linear logic there, right? So then in theory, EBE applies to all levels, formal and not formal settings of education, and preschool, grade 12, uh, higher professional. All right. The origins, of course, are from medicine. That's where it all began. And Sackett and his colleagues, David Sackett, um, really have written the Bible on how to practice and teach EBM in medicine. Right? Uh, and they would say there are really four steps, and they expect doctors to do this. So they would frame a clinical question ask the question, locate the research evidence, appraise the evidence, is it sound, is it dependable, is it tr trustworthy? So you have to know a little bit about research designs and methodology to be able to say, can I trust the evidence? 
So that's appraising, and finally make a clinical decision. But you make that clinical decision with patient needs, values, and circumstances in mind. So you see his quote here, evidence-based medicine is the integration of best research evidence on therapies with clinical expertise of the doctor and patient values. So that's, that's the idea. All right. So now, how would we uh, implement it? Let's think of, does anybody here take low-dose aspirin? My doctor has prescribed that to me. Low-dose aspirin is 80 milligrams of aspirin, okay? Now, it is supposed to improve cardiovascular health, right? And if you take that, it is supposed to reduce the risk of stroke and heart disease. That's the outcome. What's the research evidence? How would you implement it? Well, a good doctor, and my doctor is a good doctor, my, a good doctor would frame the clinical question and ask, now I have a patient here, meaning me, Mother B. Mother B is between the ages of, I won't tell you my age, <laughs> between the ages of 50 and 70. She's a woman. Her ethnic origin is, is in India. She's living in the United States. Now, for a population like that, um, what is the research evidence that this sort of low-dose aspirin therapy would work to improve cardiovascular outcomes? That's the question. The, then, of course, the doctor would have to do some research. Go on the internet, Google the studies, go to the scientific research databases, find the studies. Then they would have to appraise the evidence, see we were, well, how many of them were done with good research methods. Can I trust the evidence? Was it published in a good journal? Did it go through a peer review? These are the ways you appraise the evidence. And then have to take into account who I am, who the patient is. Will I, uh, do, what are my values? Do I have some sort of a, uh, a mindset where I don't take medicines, I don't believe in medicines, I will not comply, you know, because they can prescribe it, but if the patient doesn't comply, if the patient isn't in sync with the doctor, you're not going to see the results, right? There are multiple things that come into play. So, patient needs, values, and circumstances. I do follow the regimen, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be able to live and finish doing the work I'm here to do. What can I say? <laughs> um, but that's the thing. But the same principle applies, say, for example, with the influenza vaccine, flu vaccine. How many of you have taken that? There has to be uh, some research evidence that the flu vaccine works with all the populations. There has to be evidence there are no side effects, right? Research-based evidence. And the doctors have to make their clinical decision using the research evidence, bring it to bear as they're practicing. All right. So in EBM, in medicine, their evidence standard, the gold standard of research designs for generating sound evidence are a particular research design that belongs to a family called experimental research call them double-blinded randomized controlled trials. Have you heard of randomized controlled trials, RCTs? Okay. How many of you haven't heard it? Quite a few. Okay. So I'll just give a definition so that we're all on the same page. An RCT, so randomized controlled trials, right, is where you have uh, participants who are uh, assigned to a treatment group and a control group in a, using a method that assures placement, case assignment to treatment or control is based on chance. Random. Case assignment is independent. So, the, if it is executed properly, the procedure would equalize both groups in terms of background characteristics. So that without any intervention, the outcomes, the average outcomes of both groups would be the same. Now, if we do an experimental manipulation, we would forcibly give a treatment to one group, and that's our experimental group. 
withhold the treatment from the control group. Now, with all else held constant, if the experiment works and if the therapy works, then you're going to see outcomes. The average outcomes will favor the experimental group or the treatment group, right? That's a randomized control trial. Randomization helps com control, equalizes the treatment and control groups on all background characteristics. Gender, ethnicity, prior history of uh, a disease, but the statistical requirements must be met in terms of the number that you have in each group, right? So much for that now. All right. Now, in evidence-based medicine, they would say, well, uh, randomized control trials are good, but they have to be double-blinded. That doesn't mean anybody loses their eyesight. It simply means that um, the researcher doesn't know who's going to go into the treatment or control group, and the participant doesn't know if they are in the treatment or control group. So it's really like wearing a mask, right? No one knows. That way, you keep biases, systematic biases from entering the experiment. All right, so they would say, if the research out there on aspirin therapy, if there are RCTs, those are the studies we would look at. But even better than that would be a systematic review of a collection of RCTs. So now we can look at the average effect size of the outcomes. How big will the outcome be, right? Now, so the notion of evidence-based practices is widely accepted across fields now in, in the West. Widely accepted um, in public health, social work, medicine, every field, counseling, mental health. But there's a challenge. The one challenge is, can we carry out RCTs if the therapy is not an aspirin pill? Right? If it is a complex social intervention, which is what we find in schools. In education, it's human beings, teachers. Right? So now, and the, we're not working in laboratories where we can say all else controlled. We are an open organizational system. So now there is a challenge. There is also controversy. Does that gold standard of evidence apply outside medicine? Can we apply it? See, if we think of public health, many interventions are socially complex. Uh, in education, for sure. In social work, for sure. And similar fields, right? So there we go. So now, evidence-based medicine, the, there is a lot of controversy about evidence standards because of this issue of RCTs. There is a lot of controversy. And part of what we're going to do is de look at those debates in greater depth. But let's get a sense of what EBE would look like with the multiplication table. Um, based on, if we were applying EBE, the idea of evidence-based education, uh, to teaching multiplication tables and math facts, we would start by asking a question. And a question would be based on the latest research and the best research, which method yields the desired and lasting learning outcomes in primary students? Would it be recitation of tables, which is our traditional method, would it be sing-along? Because now if you go online, you'll find a lot of sing-along videos who will sing the tables to you. I broke, pulled out one which might be fun for you to look at. There is another method called skip counting, counting in twos, counting in threes, right? And then your own experiences, right? You might have other ways of teaching it. So there are two videos. They'll take literally two minutes each. Let us see if, if we can um, see. They, they demonstrate the sing-along and the skip-counting method. And as we watch the videos, I want you to think of in how many ways is the intervention complex. Right? We said education interventions are complex social services. In what ways is the intervention complex? 
We want to think about that, right? Okay, here's one. Sing along. It's time to sing along to a three times table song. It's as easy as can be. Have we sing along with me? We will learn efficiently. I am sure you will agree. Let's start now, please. One three is three, and two three is our six. Three three is our nine. Four three is our twelve. Five three is our fifteen, and six three is our eighteen. Seven three is our Okay, in how many ways is this? So keep taking notes. We'll play another one for you. Now this is one method, one strategy. So the, the guy is, is teaching uh, young kids and saying, look, if you want to learn the two times tables, you can count in twos. So two, skip one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, and put the eight there. Then you, you get into threes, and, and then you show one times two is two. So even if you forget, you can count, skip count in twos or skip count in threes so that you don't have to memorize it. You can work it out and you can solve your time statement. All right, that's the idea. All right, so you have your own experiences of, um, you know, the methods. But what is the research evidence, right? Now, the research evidence that I'm going to discuss is from a 2015 working paper by uh, a, a group of Stanford professors, Joe Baylor. You can look her up. Now, they have synthesized the literature in a paper called Fluency Without Fear, Research Evidence on the Best Ways to Learn Math Facts. And here are the five principles that come out of the synthesis of research. First, the neuroscience literature tell us how the human brain works and processes information nowadays. There's a lot of experimental research in that area. One is we have a working memory, which is the short-term memory. And we have a long-term memory where we store information. Um, the way we store inf information is in the form of neural networks. And our storage and retrieval process depends on how quickly we are able to organize those, use those uh, neural networks to be able to bring it to bear in uh, uh, solving a problem. So that's what we know about human physiology and the brain. The second idea that comes out of the research goes against how we've all learned uh, the tables, not by rote, but by building a number sense. So you can compare the two methods we saw, sing along, recitation, and then number, uh, you know, skip counting, which one will teach more of a number sense? Skip counting will give them a little more, right? So that you, you have to build a number sense in children. Third principle, use it or lose it. You have to show a child how to use multiplication tables in solving everyday math problems. The minute they use it, the more they use it, the better the information storage, the better the retrieval. It's like practice makes perfect. It's how I, the human being works. We don't do it that much in school, though. We don't use these principles. Third idea from neuroscience, again, is that cognitive and non-cognitive learning happens together. Our belief in whether or not we can learn math is not inborn. We learn it. We learn it by succeeding or failing in math, but by trying. And if the person teaching you is constantly saying, oh, no, you failed. You'll be no good. You couldn't even remember your two times tables. If they're saying that, they are going to, it's going to be an anxiety provoking. They're going to learn negative emotions. 
emotions are learned associated with mathematics learning, and that's going to prevent learning. On the other hand, if you have encouraged me, okay, you fell down, but get up again. You know, I know you can do it. That kind of belief is non-cognitive learning associated with cognitive learning in math will take the pressure off and they will learn better, right? That's the science. The final thing is that learning doesn't just happen with one person. There's a social interaction between the child and the teacher, child and others. For example, by talking to you all and listening to you all, I'm learning. Others are learning. It's learning is knowledge. Our knowledge structures are socially constructed, right? This is the science, right? Now, think of creating an intervention that takes into account all the science. Well, for one thing, um, you have to create a strategy, an instructional strategy, but you also have to think of practice and application. The child has to engage. The teacher can be good or bad in terms of enthusiastic or not enthusiastic, knowledgeable or not knowledgeable. That social interaction will make a difference. Complex social variables. Um, affective and cognitive learning. And then the social construction, right? So look at the number of variables here. Complex social programs the way we create them, they are multivariate and multi-component. Education inter interventions are multivariate, multi-component, and they're mediated by multiple social agents, not just the teacher. Teacher is one of the key ones, the designated one, but there are other children, there are other ways. The child can also be learning on the grandmother's lab, at home, or somebody doing homework, right? Well, we don't know that's incidental informal learning that's happening outside the school, but it's going to change the outcome. And the measurable outcome cannot be attributed only to the teacher there, right? So there we are uh, in terms of what the science says. So applying EBE needs us to think in terms of complex social programs. A mindset in education, we've got to, as you were saying, uh, we've got to think in terms of interventions being complex and socially mediated learning situation. All right, here we come to the debates. It's a hot controversy. The US Department of Education, and in fact, from 2002, the No Child Left Behind Act, and all, you know, in America we have a government school system that is predominant. It's a free compulsory education system. There are 50 states. Each state, like India, I don't know if that's true in Bangladesh where the state has its own education system. There is no federal government system, but the state, it's a, you have a national one. It's a smaller nation, so it works better. Um, but here's the thing, in the U.S. Department of Education, across states, the federal law requires adoption of the EBM position to appraise what is good evidence versus bad evidence. In other words, they are saying research designs vary in terms of rigor. The textbook research design, which is from laboratory research, tells us that the best way to determine causal effects is that x to y link, x is the program, y is the outcome, and the best way to do that is randomized controlled trials, and we've got to make them double-blinded in education, or we won't be able to trust the evidence. So now, they said, all right, our cities are the very best, but we will also accept what we call the textbooks would call quasi-experiments. Quasi, sort of not quite the real thing, but almost there, right? Now, um, it's the next best, but with reservations. And everything else, all other research methods are unacceptable. So if there is research out there and evidence, I heard someone saying, we use survey methods, very common in education. 
the federal government in the U.S. would say, that's not evidence, we're not going to look at that. That's not acceptable. All right. So they have what is called an evidence hierarchy. Only A, A-grade evidence is experimental designs. All the other research throw it out. That's basically what they say. Because they are saying if you cannot ex establish causality, cause and effect between X and Y with everything else controlled, then uh, you haven't got good research on evidence-based practices, that is. That's, what, that's their position. So they've pretty much taken the EBE position, uh, EBM position from medicine. And there are questions in the minds of many of us who have been thinking about it. Now, they've gone one step further. They've created a clearinghouse called the What Works Clearinghouse. And their mission... <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> this is the pyramid of the evidence hierarchy, experimental designs quasi-experimental designs of different grades, you know, some with different levels of control. Quasi-experiments do not randomize. The way they establish equivalence is either through matching, matched groups, comparisons, matched on important variables, or they're uncontrolled and through statistical methods using covariates, for example, uh, they, they then compare use a pretest as a covariate, and then they compare outcomes. All right? So these are all BCD. The federal government would say that's not good enough. Right, now, so they'll say their goal, the What Works Clearinghouse, is collecting research that meets their standards of rigor. And uh, they're collecting it online and saying, We'll make the job easy for you, teachers, educators out there. You can just come to our website and just search our website and you'll know whether or not a particular strategy or a program or a policy works. For example, reducing class size. What's the best class size? We've done all, you know, we've collected all the studies and the best ones have been synthesized and we've given you the results there. Makes a teacher's job easier. So this is their, uh, they review the studies, they synthesize what they call rigorous uh, research, and um, then they make that, that evidence available. And there are other collaborations that are doing that. In medicine, the Cochrane Collaboration, and in uh, education, Donald Campbell and his group. Now, what, how successful have they been? This is just to show you a little piece of the website. So here is one, exam, uh, one example of elementary school math. So they looked at how many studies. They have found 237 studies out there on elementary school math. Two studies met their standards. Two. Nobody's doing randomized control trials in education. Right. Four studies met their standards with reservations. And look at the number. 227 did not meet their standards. We don't even know what the results were. But the study didn't meet the standards because in educational research, randomized control trials are very few. We, we don't work in laboratories. Another example, dropout prevention programs. You know, somebody was talking about high school dropouts being a problem in America too, right? They want to join the world of work, so they drop out before graduating, and school systems are trying to find out how can we retrieve those dropouts, get them to graduate. Well, they did a little better. There were, um, I think, 11 studies that met standards. 12 with reservation, a bulk of them did not. All right, so what, why is it that the, we don't find randomized control trials out there? Now, the, a small, the core group of researchers who are strong advocates for evidence-based practices in education would say, education researchers are just lazy. They don't want to do rigorous experimental work. 
uh, others would disagree. So there have been lots of debates in the American Educational Research Association. And I have written papers which I got into a debate with the director of IES at a panel, right? So um, anyway, let's look at the assumptions. Let's look at why. Why are we not finding it? Because I presented this at that conference, and it came out in, in a paper in the American Journal of Evaluation. So we assume that the intervention is a tight, <coughs> almost like an aspirin pill, well-defined, tight intervention. And in the treatment group, we're at, this is the top rectangle. We are putting our experimental subjects there in that rectangle. Now, the, this is the control rectangle. Here we are analyzing and putting kids who will not get the intervention. At the end, we are measuring the average outcomes on y. Y is the dependent variable. With everything else outside the box, because it's a tight box. Nothing else gets in, right? So ideally, you'll have nothing there, no treatment. And all these other things are outside. So if you see that this average y is higher than this, and it's statistically significant, we conclude the effect is, a, is being caused by the treatment. This is what we find in the real world, though. It, the assumptions of textbook research designs go out of the window. That's why we find very few studies out there, because people are unable to hold on to those kids in, the, in those tight rectangles. They might establish their uh, randomized equivalent groups to start with, then the population is unstable, moves in and out, the composition changes, they are no longer equivalent. The, there is never a case where you have a treatment and there's nothing in the other box. There's always something, a pre-existing program that's going on. And so when you're comparing, usually the new program takes longer to take hold. Teachers need to be trained, resources need to be there. Um, and this program sometimes does better than the new one, or the new one might be research-based. Am I right or wrong? Those of you who have done this. And there could be so many other factors because it's an open system changing the outcome. So often you see no results or results in the wrong direction and you misinterpret them. So is it science? We can't carry it out. So that becomes a problem. And not just in education. If you look at the Journal of Applied Behavioral Analysis, they did a study of programs, not just education, in large organizations and businesses between the 1980s to 2009. The number of randomized control trials are the black bars. The rest are other research methods. Because when you go into complex social interventions, they're not just in education, it's very hard to mount and sustain randomized control trials. That's why you don't see them out there. That's why the What Works Clearinghouse is finding only one or two. Maybe those studies were done in labs and they haven't gotten into schools yet. And if you haven't gotten into schools, that evidence is not sustainable. Remember, we're talking about sustainable quality. Right? So the mission has to change and our approach to this has to change. So now we have a discussion. So I will take your questions and all of us can try answering it. But I had some of these. How would you? I, I started with a definition that was borrowed from medicine. How would you define evidence-based education? What are the merits and disadvantages of EBE in, in the textbook definition that we saw? Should we throw the idea out of the window? Or do we hold on to it and say there's merit, or we need to reconceive it so that we can improve the quality of education? 
and what differences. You see, what works clearing house in the US is they have a good mission, but they are too rigid, as a result of which their own mission is being undermined because of the way they're implementing it. So what differences do you see in the way what works clearing house has translated evidence-based practices from medicine to education. Now, RCTs are very good to implement in a clean system, in a lab-like <coughs> environment. If it's this, you're going to go around in circles and find nothing, right? So we need other tools, and hammers versus saws, quantitative and qualitative research methods, educators, educational researchers, public health researchers, we're all better equipped if we have in our toolbox hammers, saws, and other tools, right? Tools of inquiry. So uh, to make causal inferences then, sorry, this slide will not be, this is from a table in, in a paper, but I can send you the paper if you're interested. In that paper, I looked at cases of complex social programs in mental health, in public health, and in education, and came up with the common definition parameters of what is a complex social program. Well, one characteristic is that the intervention is socially mediated. There are multiple human beings, and they are delivering the intervention. A second characteristic is that the intervention is nested within an organization system. So a teacher and child nested in a classroom, nested in a larger community or a school or a non-formal system. There are mediators and moderators. That means you can't just say X causes Y, there might be something in between, right? So you've got to recognize those mediating variables. There are also moderators. In other words, not everybody in the population will respond to the intervention in the same way. Girls might respond in one way, boys will respond in another. Effects will get moderated. They will vary depending on who is being served and how their differences interact with the intervention, right? So there are moderating variables and mediating variables. Imagine going in with blinders on, pretending they're not there. You're going to get confused with what you find. You will misinterpret the results. So the idea is you check and go immerse yourself in the chaos, learn what are the mediators that will be relevant to this research. Learn through immersion what are the moderators that will be relevant. Let's find a way to study them measure them, operationalize them, and build them into the design, right? So another one, multiple players, multiple agendas, goals, sometimes interacting, sometimes going against each other. But when that is happening, there's a lack of rationality and order in the system. See, RCTs, imagine it's a very rational system that we're getting into. That's not the way it works, right? It's irrational. So when that happens, you've got to go in and immerse yourself and study the system dynamics. And that's best done with qualitative research methods. You're not going to get very far with quantitative tools. And then last, sorry, second last, most important, unstable, undefined population. We can't assume, well, we've got these kids, we've put them in the two conditions, let's hold on to them, we'll do the experiment uh, for this duration and they'll be there at the end. No. Often they will drop out, there will be attrition, the composition will change, we'll have non-equivalence. And when it's an unstable population, it's a complex social intervention. Last characteristic. The intervention is nested within, within the system, all right? So um, between 2008 and 2010, I worked quite intensively with a group in the National Academy of Sciences in the Institute of Medicine. Uh, we were looking at the problem of obesity prevention 
and public health interventions that are out there. And uh, we had the same experience. They, the government had funded us uh, to come up with a report to say, where is the research evidence on obesity prevention programs? Because it's a public health issue now in America. So there was me and there was another methodologist. I happened to be from education. Everyone else was from medicine or from epidemiology. The, uh, the uh, committee chairs were Shiriki Kumanika from UPenn and Larry Green, uh, who are from, uh, he's from uh, University of California. But they are epidemiologists or doctors, most of them very well known. So I was the educationist, but the goal was to look at the evidence and synthesize what was happening. And what we came up with is a framework that is systems-based. Because we said, we can still do the locate the evidence, appraise the evidence, but now we have to define evidence differently. We can't say RCTs. We have to say, yes, we want to make it rigorous. We want to keep it credible. But if you're using multiple research methods, the standards for evidence change, right? Um, so we came up with rigorous, credible, systems-based evidence standards as a group. And that framework is called LEAD. Locate the evidence, start with a question. We always start with the question, because we don't know what we're going to look at, right? You start with a question, locate the evidence, evaluate the evidence, assemble the evidence, and it can be from multiple sources. Um, and inform decisions, but along the way, we make sure that we have a systems perspective, and each time we find a gap, there is no evidence, we create an opportunity for new research, new evidence generation, and that has to be funded, right? And, and it has to be conducted in the right way, otherwise we will perpetually be stuck in a situation where there is no evidence, like the What Works Clearinghouse, Two studies, that's not good enough as an evidence base. We have to, it's the same case in public health, right? So from traditional approach, from the linear logic, we went, this is the linear logic with a mediating variable. See, here's a mediator. Instructional infrastructure, teaching practices as the mediator leading to student performance out. This is a straight line logic. But if we go to a simple systems-based approach, it will look like this. We have context variables, we have input variables, it would process variables leading to outcomes, but this is still what would be called a simple situation because there is rationality, there is order. But we're looking at something here, which is if we don't find evidence, we have to go back. There's this looping back and improving teaching until we get the outcomes. Improving changing inputs until we get the outcomes. You see, this feedback loop is this continuous quality improvement loop. I'll show you another one. This is, a, this is at Teachers College in my institution. You can see, here's the program, okay? In any department, you might see curriculum instruction and assessment going on in a course. But you have to put it in the larger context of the college where there are resources. Faculty, administrative supports, infrastructure, all of that. Now that is responding to all these con contextual variables, including the constituencies, national and state requirements, and societal standards. Now, if the, these process variables are working, input and process working well, we are going to get some results with our student candidates. And they will be KSD, knowledge, skills, and dispositions will change, right? And whether or not teachers' college standards of excellence are being met. Uh, but if they're not, we could also aggregate to the program on the teacher's college level. If we're not, we can go back here, use multiple data, data sources for quality assurance so that we get a nice profile of what's going on. Or if we didn't achieve outcomes, 
why we didn't get the outcomes, right? And then go back and fix the things where we find gaps. So there has to be this loop. Thinking in systemic terms, this is also one where we are assuming rationality, but initially within a system you may find or disorder and chaos, but by this is where organizational learning comes in. Engaging people, learning collectively, buying in to a value structure until there is some semblance of rationality where the system begins to work, right? So hammers and saws, quantitative research methods allow us to answer questions on cause and effects when we are able to rigorously implement them using textbook guidelines, correlations, relationships, how large is the effect, effect size, and so we have experimental designs, quasi-experimental designs, as well as non-experimental designs, including surveys, explanatory and descriptive. Now, our methods of analysis subscribe to what is called the variance theory of causation. If I change this, does this change? Variance theory. Now, qualitative research methods, different tools, they can't answer those questions, but they can answer how. How did, if we are seeing results, how did it happen? Why did it happen? Understanding phenomena and processes. Uh, so this is more about in-depth, rich description, interpretation, and critical philosophical methods. This is called the process theory of causation. You know, like historians use the process theory of cause and effect to be able to say what large events cause these outcomes to happen, right? They're doing de qualitative research. Doesn't mean you can't answer cause and effect questions, but you frame the questions differently, you ask a different question. So both sets can be implemented in a slipshod, shoddy way, or we can be rigorous, right? Each field, each discipline has its own in tools of inquiry, and there's a good way to apply those research methods in a bad way. And the training, peer review, and meta-evaluations are the way we, in most disciplines, we uh, try to control the rigor of research evidence that is out there, right? Through a peer review system, through meta-evaluations, evaluating evaluations, by looking at it through external reviews by credible experts, right? So uh, there are diverse group, these are some of the people I've worked with, who have actually been thinking about new ways going beyond uh, randomized controlled trials. Steve Rambush was one of the advocates of RCTs. He helped write some of the initial documents on uh, the Watworks Clearinghouse. Very famous statistician. I don't know if you've read his book with Tony Bright on hierarchical linear modeling. Famous HLM software, Steve Brown Bush, okay. So he has begun to rethink because randomized co uh, control trials uh, uh, when you control an experiment very tightly, what happens is the scale-up and generalizability, you lose that. You get internal validity of the experiment, but external validity is lost. So he's been thinking of new designs that can improve generalizability and scale-up. Remember, we talked about sustainable development with quality. We have to think of generalizability and scaling up. Nancy Wolf works in the criminal justice field. She's also been thinking a lot about uh, complexity issues and complex social services. Um, and she has outlined several of the problems uh, I found in education and public health, she found in, in these other fields. So it was wonderful to meet her. And I found that, my goodness, our moderators and mediators are similar. <laughs> so we had a long chat about moderators and mediators. <laughs> so uh, Reynolds, he's worked in a field where you 
cannot implement our cities. Why? They are big, federally funded programs. You cannot experimentally manipulate them. They are already there. Private schools versus public schools. Pre-existing large systems. If you want, but still, if stakeholders are asking which one is better, you want to be able to do it, do the study. So he has thought of confirming causal effects without experimental manipulation through a method that is non-experimental. And he has six criteria. Now, if you want to read his paper, I'll share it with you. But his six criteria, one of them is the cause has to precede the effect. Another is if you increase the dosage, whatever the cause is, you increase the outcomes. Are we seeing results on all of these, right? Um, so Reynolds would say, yes, you can approximate causal inferences even if your data are collected using surveys or non-experimental methods but it has to be rigorous and there are criteria. Eisenhardt is, Margaret Eisenhardt gave us the philosophical theory of um, knowledge production in the uh, objectivist science perspective, that experimental research versus the qualitative, right? So uh, her paper is also very interesting. And then, of course, there are some papers that I've written. And I have uh, um, really thought in terms of if we are looking at field contexts and field-based complex social interventions, uh, what are the complexity issues? What are the sources of complexity? How can we gather comprehensive evidence of what works by changing the questions we ask? So my method, which we have implemented, is called Extended Term Mixed Methods Design, ETMM. So we ask the questions differently. Instead of uh, what are the effects and does it work or does it not, we ask whether it works, under what conditions, on whom, and how. Because it may not have the same impact on everybody in the same way. We use systems-based logic models. We do a contextual analysis, so our causal pathways are based on actual immersion. We have two stages of our studies. Exploratory phase, we, where we go into the system and we're really doing preliminary learning studies and formative decision making. And then at the latter end, we begin to do confirmatory studies. There, if, if the conditions are good, we do implement experimental designs. But we've done the qualitative work to know whether or not experimental designs will work. So I'm using mixed research methods for complementarity. All right, I'm going to skip this and finish. Now, if we ask the question, is EV, so we can do EVE differently. That's, that was the point of my second segment. And it's just not me talking, a lot of people are saying that. But is EVE enough? Or do we need more? Where would EVE fit within the larger framework of evaluation and monitoring, right? So, these are some common ways in which we do evaluation. We do needs assessment studies and context evaluations. That is, before you design an intervention, you study the needs. We're going to do a needs assessment today. Um, and study the context. And then design the program based on the data you've got gathered. So you're not going in there and designing an intervention in a blind way. You understand what, what the needs are. Process evaluations and implementation monitoring studies, that's self-explanatory. Impact evaluations and outcome studies, that's your what works question. And then cost effectiveness and efficiency studies. Are we getting, in America they would say, are we getting the bang for the buck, right? If you're putting in money, and the federal government always wants to know, what is the bang for the buck? What's the effect if there is a money per unit cost 
what is the size of the effect. Right? Now, these can be done in formative ways or summative ways or a combination. So we want to see what, what does formative decision making mean when you're doing evaluation. Formative is when you conduct the studies, but you use the results to inform, to revise, refine, and improve the program. Not to prove, but to improve. And summative is to make a summary judgment of the worth or the merit of the program. Now, this is the what works question. Does it work or does it not? Right? And usually, it's about continuation, a decision about continuation or discontinuation. Can we fund it or not? Let's forget it. Right? That kind of thing. Now, there are many motivations for and models of evaluation predominant in the US. And I'm going to ask you to get engaged now. Um, for example, we have institutional accreditation. We have that program accreditation, self-studies, classroom assessments, direct observations, school inspections, some quality improvement models in higher education. You see that happening. But most are these large-scale annual outcome monitoring studies. And they are done with tests of a student at the macro system level, large-scale student testing um, in different subject areas, reading, math, science. And national assessment of educational progress is done annually, every year. So using random cluster sampling of all the states. The goal is to not only look at trends over time, uh, but also to look at achievement gaps between different ethnic groups, between poor and wealthier students, and so on and so forth. Monitoring achievement gaps in different kids is a big thrust of the US government. You've heard of the program of international student assessment, PISA? Yes. OK, well, that's run by OECD. Educational testing service in the U US, actually, they are the researchers and scientists who created the original, which was uh, the Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study. And now OECD has borrowed it. The main thing is those link tables, international comparisons and comparing it to which country is better than the other, right? It's basically like a horse race. Um, and, but the, the inferences made are they valid? That's, that's a question you have to ask. There's a lot of high stakes accountability testing of students in, in schools um, under the common core framework. And teachers and schools are evaluated based on that. Achievement gap monitoring, a lot of public shaming media. <laughs> so the criticism you hear a lot, especially in academic circles, is that all summative, too much summative, and you've wiped out the formativity, and teachers are always under the gun, and they're teaching to the test. So, um, but the media love link tables. They are going to problem. The first, you know, what they want to know is where is the country ranked among other nations. Forget about the history, government, uh, you know, background of the education system, the population. So none of that matters. Who is the highest, right? So um, there's a lot of misinterpretation. So although outcome measurement is most popular, we have to think of validity, reliability, and utility. And that is often undermined. The psychometric quality of the assessment data and making appropriate inferences, right? So uh, you, your thoughts, I'll come to this now before we do, but I'll, give you, I'll end this by showing this. A recent, I edit a journal called Quality Assurance in Education now, and two papers, which I thought were interesting, Rubai and Wilkerson, 
who, who looked at only higher education institutions and synthesized um, what the data indicators should be using multiple research methods. Curriculum and instruction quality evidence-based education comes in right there. But the others were these. Student learning and achievement is one. Continuous improvement processes. Quality of faculty, facilities, equipment, fiscal and administrative management, student support services, and then looking at diversity, access, opportunity to learn, and inclusiveness, right? These are the indicators based on research, international body of research on higher education institutions, what should we collect data on, and where does EBE fit, you can see. All right, so my final thoughts are these. No question that evaluation is becoming very significant and, and people are buying into the idea of evaluation. But evaluation monitoring and evaluation research that we do is different from academic research. How is it different? Well, for one thing, evaluation has a social betterment agenda as opposed to just adding to the knowledge base in a discipline or building theory, right? And then the other thing is that stakeholders have to be involved. Um, so using evaluation research involves organizational social policy factors and this thing about organizational learning, right? So no single model or tool is optimal. There is a role and place for EBE, but organizational learning and capacity building needs is something that we should actually talk about. So um, we are going to ask for your recommendations, but I think this is something that I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on. And this will be our closing discussion. These are all questions. What are the motivations for and models of evaluation in South Asia that you know of? And do you see EBE fitting in? And where should we go from here?